Oh. Good evening, and welcome to another Bible study here at Hurricane Baptist Church. Uh, we'll continue our study in the book of Acts, and we've been, this will be our 72nd lesson in the book of Acts, so we've been here quite a while, and we worked our way up to chapter 23, and we'll be starting in verse 12 here this evening, as we continue our study of Paul, we know that he's, as far as his churches, starting churches and his missionary trips there, there in the past now, he's on his way to Jerusalem, well, he's at Jerusalem now, and uh, he's going to be moving around and heading on to Rome for a long. And uh, we see that he's been struggling a lot. He's got a lot going on. So we, we know they've been trying to kill him. They tried about three times to kill him. They're going to try. They, they, they're persistent. Uh, they're not going to give up too easy. So we want to kind of take a look, see what's going to happen. So if you have your Bibles, you want to follow along. We're going to be in uh, Acts uh, chapter 23. And we'll be starting at verse number 12. And we'll look at verses, what, 12 to 15 here to start with. It says, And uh, when it was day... Certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. And there were more than forty which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priest and the elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a great curse, that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. Now therefore ye with the council signify to the chief captain that he bring him down unto you tomorrow, as though ye would inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever he be, ever he come near, are ready to kill him. So what they have a conspiracy now. They had their chance. Uh, back we look back and uh, back around chapters 23 verses 9 and 10 along in there. Uh, they had their chance to head him for the council. If the Sadducees and the Pharisees had come together, they had him. But they remember they got into that fight. That's Sadducees said there is no resurrection. The Pharisees says there is a resurrection. And Paul, being a Pharisee, said, hey, I'm a Pharisee. So the Pharisees wouldn't decide with him. So we had this big, big conflict. And then, of course, in verse 11, we see where God told Paul, he said, you know, don't worry, I'm, I'm here with you. And so now they're, but here they go. They're going to they're gonna get together here. They're going to have this uh, bond between them. They're going to uh, kill Paul. They want to get rid of Paul. Uh, if you remember... Uh, back when uh, Paul was trying to kill the Christians. And uh, he, he thought he was doing God a favor. He thought those Christians were false teachers. They were they were wrong. He'd get rid of the Christians. And Paul was really fervor. And, you know, by getting those, he was really wanting to get rid of the Christians. And so we see, in this case now, he, when he got he got saved, when he became an a apostle to the Gentiles, uh, he was just as strong for the, for the Christian. And he was out witnessing. He was out leading people to Christ. He was out planting churches. And so we see these these men now. They think it, it's not that they're that uh, it's just Paul. No, it's what he stands for. It's what he represents. And, and so they think they're doing God a favor, and uh, they have the idea now that well, they know the Bible tells, and of course they're great in the law. Thou shalt not kill. But they're thinking, you know what? In this case, because he's such an enemy of God, uh, if maybe God will just overlook it. Or they might have the idea, you know, uh, you heard people say this, well, you do it now and ask forgiveness later. Well, they, they believe they're doing right. We call that uh, pragmatism. It, it's not what you do, it's the end result that counts. So if you, have to, if you have to lie, you have to cheat, you have to steal, whatever you have to do to get to what you want, that's okay. And so they're believing that no matter, even if they have to kill Paul, commit, violate that commandment, they believe that it's going to be okay. And uh, that God will accept that, that God would understand that. And, and we know that that's not the kind of God we serve. Is it? Uh, God is a God of order. God is a God of law. And when he says, thou shalt not kill, that's what he means. And so we look at this and we see what they're, they're conspiring about. And uh, we don't know how many got together. Somebody started it. But anyway, they've recruited like 40 different people now. They've got 40 of them. That's all part of this conspiracy. So it's the, the hatred for Paul. And we see how he appeared before the... The different groups. There's a there's a great uh, multitude after this wanting to get rid of Paul, and uh, so they they brought in 40 more, uh, or 40 all together here. That's gonna uh, hey, this is this is what we're gonna do. If we just get the chance, just give us the chance to get to Paul, we're gonna get rid of him. And um, we see then what they so they go ahead and they get a little bit of a, a little help here. They came to the verse 14 says they came to the chief priests and the elders. So they came to get their kind of get their blessing on her to get their uh, willingness to go along with this conspiracy because they're going to have to do the ones to initiate the contact with Paul. 
But you know, now the, here's the religion, religionists and the, the elders. These should be the, you know, they're the ones that really understand the, the law, the Bible, the, the Word of God. And they're even willing to, to compromise their values, compromise their standards here to get Paul. And so we just, it, it's hard to imagine, you know, we live in a world today and, and uh, a lot of times you hear over in the Middle East and now where the Christians are being persecuted for the faith, where, where the Muslims and extremists come in and they just uh, kill people that are Christian. In fact, they kill a lot of people that aren't Christian too, but they go in and they persecute Christians. They hate Christians so much. And it, it's kind of hard to conceive anybody having that much of a hatred for someone. And when you stop and consider uh, these men, and they're so sold out for the law, they're they're so sold out for their their religion. Okay, they believe that the, you got to have the law of Moses, and you got to be circumcised, and you got to have you know obey the feast, got to do all these things. And and they believe that Paul was teaching and preaching that those things don't matter anymore once you become a Christian. Well, Paul wasn't doing away with any of that. Uh, you can be circumcised if you want to be circumcised. You can you can obey the feast if you want to obey the feast. He wasn't saying you couldn't do that. You can obey the law. You can you. Can, Dedicate yourself just to obeying the law, but it has nothing to do with getting you saved. What he was telling them is faith is what saves you, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so they were on works, and Paul said there is no works. And remember, we talked about that back earlier at the Jerusalem Council. Uh, this Paul, what he was preaching was good, it was right, and so it was acceptable. And he said, just, we just want them not to, to, uh, to shed blood or partake in uh, meat, worship the idols, stuff like that. It was just because they were saved, not to get them saved or keep them saved, but because they're saved, to be a testimony, to be a witness. And so these men here, they, they're convinced that they're doing what God would want them to do. So they go to the, the chief priest and the elders here, and they say, you know, here's what we want to do. Here, here's our plan, how we're going to get him. And so we go ahead, and he says, now, therefore, you with the council signify to the chief captain, before they had met with him, that's what we read back up in the early part of this chapter, he said that this is, you, want, you want to know something else. Hey, uh, can we see Paul again? Bring him down to us again. we got some more questions for him, some more clarification on what we was talking about earlier. And so they said, whoever, when he comes down, whoever he gets close enough to that they can get him, we're going to kill him. So here we see what's going to happen now. It looks, doesn't look good for Paul, does it? Uh, these 40 men, and they're going to be bringing him down. And when Paul's sister's son, uh, his nephew here, heard of their lying in wait, he went and, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. So here's this... This nephew, he hears what's going on, and his Uncle Paul, they're going to try to kill Uncle Paul. And, and so he goes to Uncle Paul here, and he tells him uh, what's happening. And then Paul says, you know, he called one of the centurions, those that were gardening there unto him, and said, uh, bring this young man uh, unto the chief captain, for he had a certain thing to tell him. So he took him, uh, the centurion took the young man, his nephew there, and brought him uh, to the chief captain and said, uh, Paul the prisoner called me unto him and prayed me to bring this young man unto thee who hath something to say to him, say to thee. So we see this, he calls him a young man here, but then when we look at verse 19, you kind of wonder how old he really was uh, because the chief captain took him by the hand. And you would think if he was a young man, the captain wouldn't be taking him by the hand. But anyway, he takes him in and... So this nephew, he's responded in the right way, didn't he? He heard that his uncle's in trouble, and so he went to his uncle, and Paul responded in the right way. He sent him to the authorities, those that are in charge. There's, there's this order here. And we see that this chief captain is a, um, he's a pagan. He's a Roman, as far as we know. He has no, I, no love for Christians, as far as that goes. But, but he's, he's a, a, a moral person. He has a, a, a moral compass about him that uh, he, he cares about Paul as far as a Roman citizen. He cares about what they're trying to do to Paul. And so he, he takes him in there, took him by the hand, and, and went with him aside privately. He said, now, uh, what, is it, what is it that thou hast to tell me? So the, the, his nephew, Paul's nephew, says, and he said, the Jews have agreed to desire thee that thou wouldst bring down Paul tomorrow unto the council, as though they would inquire somewhat of, more, of him more perfectly. In other words, we need to know more. We want to know the complete story. <clears throat> but, uh, but do not yield unto them. Now here's a young man, a boy here, basically, he's saying, here's, here's what you need to do. He says, don't yield to them, for uh, they're, they're, they're lying wait for him uh, more than 40 men which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. 
and now are they ready looking for a promise from thee so what they want to see is you're going to bring him down and you know it's kind of uh, uh, kind of unique if you would or kind of strange but you remember the, the vow that they made now we know as we get into the story a little bit more we know they don't kill Paul because Paul ends up going down to Rome so you, you wonder if they ever ate or drank anything after that because they were really so glad. This is what hey, this was a vow. This was the curse here. They was putting on Paul, and, and they was under this bond to one another. They said, we're not going to eat or drink anything until he's dead. And Paul lived quite a while longer. So they see if I wonder if they kept the vow. But anyway, so the chief chief captain uh, then let the young man go, depart, and, and charged him, saying, uh, Thou tell no man that thou hast showed these things to me. <clears throat> Excuse me, so we see the this chief captain, he's trusting this little boy, this young man. He says, um, so he must, there must be some integrity there, some trust there, because he, otherwise he could say, you know what, you just stay here for another day until this is all over, until we get Paul out of here, and then you can go on home. He told him, so you don't, don't tell anybody. Don't tell mom or dad, don't tell anybody else. You keep this to yourself. And then we see this, the response of this, um, this chief captain, this, how this conspiracy is going to fall apart. So what happened is he calls these two centurions, and saying, make thee ready, listen, 200 soldiers that go to Caesarea and horsemen, so we're going to have 200 soldiers and we're going to have horsemen three, core, three score and ten, so he's going to have 200 foot soldiers, he's going to have uh, seven, 70 horsemen, and he's going to have 200 spearmen. So uh, we know that the conspirators are 40 people, so he is, he is definitely making sure they're not going to get hold of Paul. He's going to protect them. He's going to do what he has to do. He's, been, he's responsible, and so he's going to do what he has to do to take care of Paul. He says in verse 24, And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on, so give them a horse or some kind of animal for Paul to ride on and bring him safe, and to Felix the governor. So this, this uh, chief captain, we see that how... How God's sovereignty is. See, here's a case where, where God is using an, a, a pagan uh, Roman uh, centurion, or not centurion, but a chief captain. Uh, he's using his pagan, but in God and his sovereignty, he uses people. He uses, uh, sometimes it's believers, sometimes it's unbelievers, but he uses people to accomplish his will. And what he's doing here, he's taking this 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 moral, this guy has some, is responsible, uh, he has an understanding of right and wrong, and he's definitely not going to let this Roman citizen be taken uh, by these 40 men. So he's going to take care of them and protect them. And, and as we just uh, uh, note, and it was noted earlier, what keep, kept Paul from getting a, a good beating uh, was the fact that he's a Roman citizen. And it's, it's, that's one of those things that we kind of hear about, but it doesn't be, seem so significant. Back earlier in uh, Acts when we read about Paul, how he's a Roman citizen. But as we get into this portion of the scripture, this portion of his life, we see the how important it was that God had him born in, born into a Roman family. Okay, they were Jewish, but they were also Roman citizens, and he has that citizenship. And so, how that has protected him and kept him, and now God is using this chief captain to uh, to bring this all this power of Rome around Paul to keep him from these forty people. And so, we, again, God works in strange ways. We don't understand how He works. We, he has it all laid out. It's all set there, and God looks down through the annals of time. He says, this is what's going to happen, and this is going to happen, and, and it all falls into place. And, and he has Paul here. Paul's, Paul has a purpose, and Paul's not going to go through this, this portion of his ministry, this portion of his life, without accomplishing what God wants him to do. Remember, that's what he wanted. He wanted to get to Jerusalem. And he wanted to go to Rome, and even from Rome, we talked saw it right there where he wanted to go to Spain. So he's he's looking to the future, but Paul wants to be found faithful every step of the way. He doesn't want to take any time when he's not being faithful. So when he has opportunity, he shares his testimony. He shares who he is. He shares what Christ is, who Christ is, and what he's done for him. So we get here, and so this this centurion, he's got the got these people all together, all these these horsemen, and you know this is a formidable uh, group of men that he has here. These are all Roman soldiers, and so he has. So now he's going to write a letter. Okay, he said, I want you to take him to Felix. We're going to provide some kind of a, a animal for him to ride on, and he's going to go to Felix, and I'm going to send this letter with you. So he said he wrote a letter in verse 25 after this matter. So here's what he's saying uh, to Felix. Uh, Claudius Lysias, and this is the chief captain, and to the most excellent governor Felix, sendeth greetings. He said, this man, talking about Paul, was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. 
Then came I with an army and rescued him, having understood that he was a Roman. Well, we guess not exactly what happened, but it's pretty close. Uh, they was going to beat him up first, and then they found out he was a Roman, and so he, he, he got him away from them. And when I would have known the cause wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth into their council. So what he's saying here is, you know, what's going on? So what I did, I took went before their council. I brought him there so that he could he could uh, talk to them, and I could understand what was going on. And whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law. So he didn't he didn't understand their law. He didn't understand the law of Moses. He was he's not a Christian, and so he's really ignorant of the law. But he said, uh, I, I, he was accused of questions of the laws, but they have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. He said, I, I listened to what they had to say. And he said, I, I heard nothing that he should have been killed for. I should seen, heard nothing that he should have been thrown in prison and put in bonds for. So he said, I, and so in verse 30 says, And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for this man, I sent straightway to thee and gave commandment to his accusers also that they say, that they say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. So we see the letter and he says, here's what's happened. Here's this man. I'm sending him to you. I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, this, the Jews are all up, up in the air about him. They want to kill him. I will get rid of him. So I'm sending him to you. He's under my protection. I'm getting him to you. And... Uh, then I told his accusers, and now you go to Felix, and you go to Felix, and you uh, confront this situation with Felix. And so we see what's going to happen here. So they sent him the letter, then the, then the soldiers, as it was commanded, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. On the morrow, they left uh, the horsemen to go with him and uh, returned to the castle. So here we the horsemen are going to take him on. Uh, who, when they came to Caesarea and delivered the epistle, this letter to the governor, presented Paul also before him. So they, they got him in before uh, Felix now. He's, uh, he's there. He's, he's there safe. He's ready to give his testimony. And he's going to be able to, to talk to them. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province uh, he was. And when he understood that he was of Cilicia, he understood. So it was within his authority. It was in his area of authority. I will hear thee. And I said, he then thine accusers are also come, and he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. So we're going we're gonna to stop there. So we see, here's Paul. He's before Felix now. He's been wanting to do something. He wanted to, he's been uh, willing to give his testimony. He's been willing to, to go to Jerusalem. He got to Jerusalem, and we read back earlier, they were waiting. They were upset with him when he got there. And because of what they thought he was teaching and preaching. And remember also, they thought that he took... Um, who was it into the into the synagogue? Uh, so we we under Titus into the synagogue. A, a a Gentile. So we know that Paul is before Felix. He has he's going to have the opportunity to talk to Felix now. And uh, there's a I wrote down a verse. It says we're in Mark uh, thirteen nine. He says, "Ye shall be brought before the rulers uh, and kings for, for my sake." For a testimony against them, so Paul is going to be able to to confront Felix. He's going to be in front of Felix, and he's going to have a chance to to talk to Felix about uh, Christ. He's going to have a, a chance to give his testimony. We're going to see how this all plays out as he goes to Felix, and then this uh, all works out as he ends up going to Rome here for long. But the idea is that that Paul is going to take every opportunity he has to share the gospel, to share who he is and what Christ has done for him, and that's what you and I need to do. Uh, no matter what happens, we need to be ready, willing, and able to share the gospel, to share what, who we are and whose we are, and the fact that we're, we're a child of the king, and God's going to take care of you. He says, don't worry about what you're going to have to say when you're brought before the rulers, or someday we might be before the authorities for, for being a Christian, for preaching or teaching the wrong things according to the, the law. But the idea is that we're just going to stand firm and take those opportunities to witness, to bear witness to Christ. And also then, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, all right, if you're not as Christian, you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, this is a time. And you, it's, a, it's a very simple process. The, the price for your redemption has been paid when Christ died on the cross. He shed His blood as payment to redeem you. And so all you need to do is, in your, from your heart, believe that and trust that. And then when you do that, you repent, you turn from your sin. You turn from the world, you turn to Christ and put your faith and trust in that shed blood of Christ for your salvation. That's the only thing to say to you. It's not baptism, it's not good works, it's nothing else. It's Christ and Christ alone. 
But believe in baptism, believe in good works and all that, but that's not part of your salvation. It's something we do after salvation. But this is the day. Don't don't put it off. The devil says you got plenty of time. You don't know that, and I don't know that. We don't know what kind of time we got, but we know that God is sovereign. God's in control. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do just I thank you for this day. Lord, we just we thank you for this uh, history that we read about Paul and his his faithfulness and as he's been he's mistreated and uh, things happen. He's been beaten and he's been in prison and all kind of false accusations against him, Lord. But but you've been faithful to him and and sometimes we people might look and think, well, look what Paul went through. It didn't seem like God took care of him, but you did. You took care of him through it all. He he accomplished what you wanted to accomplish through him, Lord. And we know that he was faithful all the way to the end. And we pray, Father, that we too might be faithful, that you just be able to trust us, that when we're confronted with our, our testimony, when we're confronted by the authorities or whoever would oppose us, that we'll stand firm on our faith. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for what you've done and for what you're going to do. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.